everybody hear me? Everyone can hear me? Okay. All right. Wow. There are a lot of people in here. Um, thank you, first of all, for... Hey, wait. You can't see me on which side? <laughs> You're addressing me. Um, <laughs> so hopefully you can see me. I can move a little bit more over. Is that better? All right. All right. For the win. All right. So... <laughs> Thank you all for inviting me to be here. Um, one of the things that the uh, event planners charged me with doing was both being provocative and giving you guys an agenda, something to walk away with after this you know, lecture, this TED talk. Uh, walk away out of Memorial Chapter with something to do. Um, and so I tried out this talk actually right before I came here on a group of people at CHOM, and it ended up provoking an argument a little bit of a tiff, some agreement, reconsideration. So hopefully you guys will come to the same thing. It'll actually inspire something. Maybe it's hatred, maybe it's happiness, but hopefully you'll leave here with something. Um, so the title of my talk is a little bit deceptive. The death of affirmative action, dun, 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 right? Originally I wanted a question mark in there. I was told no, no question mark is much more controversial. <laughs> and so I think, one of the things that might you know, come across from the title is, is Professor Wright going to be talking about the Supreme Court's decision to, refu uh, to review affirmative action, right? this big, meaty case that is in front of the court right now? Um, actually, that's not what I'm going to talk about in the least. And in fact, by the uh, time I'm done talking, one of the things that I hope you'll think about is that maybe that case is completely irrelevant to the way that we think about social justice, the way we think about equality, and the way that we think about race. And I say all of that because the debate that surrounds affirmative action is completely useless. It's pointless. Uh, it's visceral. It is vicious. It is angry. It is ugly. It is sparked by misinformation. It is defensive. It is unproductive. Resentment tinges all sides of the debate, largely because this concept of individual rights the rights of the individual, are always going to be in conflict with the idea of the rights of the collective, right? Now, affirmative action, race-based affirmative action in particular, comes out of a certain historical moment with a very specific agenda. Address inequality. Address the historic discrimination of particular underrepresented groups. A way to rectify or correct for past discrimination, but also prevent continuing discrimination. Right? So a way, a kind of conscious for the, nature, uh, for the nation. Um, and so I think it's one way for us to think about how we define affirmative action, especially in this present day moment. Now, in many ways, affirmative action has been incredibly beneficial. Race-based affirmative action has been incredibly beneficial. One look at the statistics proves that. It has helped underrepresented minority populations gain access to places that they otherwise would have been denied. There is no denying that. And it's an incredibly important point for us to keep in mind. But at the same time, we have to take into consideration the fact that race-based affirmative action is not perfect. In fact, it's an imperfect system in part, in large part, actually, becomes, because it comes out of an imperfect period of time. One of the things that I wanted to focus on originally when I thought about this talk was the way in which there's a continuing gap between underrepresented peoples of color and right, the white dominant majority. And how come affirmative action has not addressed that continuing and uh, widening gap? Why hasn't it addressed that? Part of this problem is that if, we, if, affirmative, if everything was perfect, right, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need affirmative action. But the simple existence of the program says that we continue to need it. Um, but one of the things that we really just don't talk about, I think, is the way in which kind of the controversial nature of the debate actually gets in the way of us having a useful discussion about the issues. Things are so polarized that it is impossible for people to sit down and concentrate on the fundamental continuing problems, race and class. So 
How do we get to those meaty issues? How do we begin to address those meaty issues without right, this policy context or context hanging over our head? Well, I think one of the ways is by recognizing implicit bias. Now, what do I mean by implicit bias? Bias in the way that we do things, in the way that we operate, the way we think about things, the way that we envision the world, the way that we uh, conduct our day-to-day -day operations. Now, when I say implicit bias, it's both controversial and not so controversial. We all have implicit biases. We all do things automatically, in a split second. But just because we do those things in a split second doesn't mean we ha don't have control over those things, or we can't train ourselves to recognize those things. So implicit bias, what do I mean by that specifically within this context? Well, in groups, particularly groups in power, discriminate against people that are different. And I don't mean in the sense of explicit racism or identifiable racism. No, we're in a way kind of beyond that. I mean in a sense that people tend to favor individuals that are like them, groups that are like them. We tend to push away difference. And so part of what identifying a, uh, 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 implicit bias is all about is pushing ourselves to recognize that there are certain things that we do that need to be corrective. So let me give you a couple examples, just very quickly. Lynn's sanity. How many of you know about Lynn's sanity? Everybody in this room should know about, if you are a real basketball fan, you know about Lynn's sanity, right? But part of the shock and awe that surrounds that doesn't come from this particular player being so good, even though he is, it comes from the fact that he's Asian. And we assume that Asian people can't be athletic. So let me give you another example, right? Someone says, I'm a white woman. I worked really hard to get into college. I got here based on merit. But hey, that Latino person over there, affirmative action. Let me give you another example, just to mix it up a little bit. Chris Rock, what does he say in that famous comedy special that everyone in this room should have seen? If you haven't, go out and see it. It's classic, right? I love black people, but I hate niggas, right? Right? So he differentiates. And one of the reasons that we laugh so hard is because implicitly, there's something within us that agrees. And let me give you one last example that I think is particularly relevant given our understanding of social justice in this moment. Black men, if we wear a hoodie, we're suspicious dangerous, we, we uh, turn away in fear, right? We lock our car's doors. In a split-second decision, we cast our eyes in a different direction so that we don't have to address those people. So there's a way in which this operates that I think is much more to the point of what we are trying to get at, especially in terms of thinking about justice. So how do we address all this? How do we get beyond this? Well. Step number one is something I've already identified. Recognize that you practice individual implicit bias. Everybody in this room does it. But the next part is a little bit higher, uh, harder. Seek out people that are radically different from you. People who think differently from you. People who are in different organizations. People who don't, not just people who look different, but people who also bring different experiences, people who disagree. Now, I'm not saying everybody needs to end ultimately disagree, I mean agree and kumbaya, but we need to actively seek out people that sound different from ourselves in order to push ourselves to think better. Now, I know we're an all enlightened, progressive, radical crowd here at Wesleyan, but chances are, if you're sitting in the audience and saying, Psh, this doesn't apply to me, I've been there, I've taken that class. <laughs> mm. <laughs> then you actually really do need to push yourself harder. You should always be consistently and constantly thinking about these things. I think this really gives us the opportunity to do something that is really invested in social justice and allows us ultimately to say, regardless of, say, what the Supreme Court decides with something like affirmative action, 
that it's completely irrelevant to the way in which we envision ourselves in relationship to other people in this world. So I'm out of time, but thank you so much.